I heard something the other day and it really triggered something in my, in my spirit about time with God. In Genesis 1.1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now some people have read all sorts of nonsense into this scripture um, but basically what it's saying here, verse 1, is the headline. God creates heaven and earth. Now it starts to tell you how he did it. He first of all created uh, a sphere that we live on, but he hadn't finished with it yet. Hadn't done the land and the sea and the sun and the moon and the animals and all that. So he's just started. Then he said, the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters. What's the Spirit of God hovering for? He's waiting to be told what to do. He's doing that in your life as well. He's waiting to know what to do. When you cry out to God for healing, say, the Holy Spirit's there, he will do that for you. If you're crying out to God for a blessing of finances, say, the Holy Spirit is there, ready to do it for you. If you're looking for peace in your life, the Holy Spirit is there and he will bring that into your life. He's there, hovering, waiting for you to call out. Waiting for, to go and work in your life, to do the work in you, and to do the work for you. He wants things to be better for you in the name of Jesus. So there's the Holy Spirit hovering, waiting to be told what to do. And God said, let there be light, and was light. There was light. Or as the original Hebrew said, God said, light be, light was. It's like when you switch a switch on. When we switched the switch this morning on these lights, we didn't, well, didn't have to come in yesterday and switch them on. I hope by this morning they were going to be on. It was instant. And when God said, light be, it had to come immediately. Light came immediately. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and he called the darkness night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. But back in verse 1, just to clarify this, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This isn't when God started to exist. He was there before that. So in the beginning, what does it mean by in the beginning? This is when time as we know it began. The clock started ticking. And over the whole scheme of things, over all the thousands of years there's been, not millions, by the way. Over all the thousands of years there's been, we're getting to the point where actually it's about two minutes to midnight. Because Jesus is coming back. Amen. Soon. Amen. So God wants us to know that he started something that day. He began something that day. But he'd begun something even further back than that, as we'll see later. But time as we know it on this earth began that day. And God saw that everything he'd done was good. I mean, it took him six days. Now, I don't know about your God, but my God could have done it in six milliseconds. Microseconds, picoseconds, nanoseconds. He could have just clapped his hand and the whole thing would have been done instantly. But he chose to do it day by day because he knew we were going to have to live our life day by day. And he's created a difference then between the light and the dark, between the good and the evil. And we have to make that choice between light and darkness every day. We have to choose the light and not the dark, things that are around. Also it says, and at the end of it he says, so the evening and morning were the first day. That sounds backwards, doesn't it? Evening and morning, the first day? No, that's how the Hebrew calendar is. The Hebrew calendar T tomorrow we'll begin at 6 p.m. tonight and we'll go to 6 p.m. the following night the day begins at 6 p.m. that's why it said the evening and the morning do you remember in the book of Acts it says when the day of Pentecost will fully come and they, they were all together and they said what's the matter are these people drunk it's only the third hour of the day why is it the third hour of the day because the actual daytime not evening the morning started at 6 a.m. Making it nine o'clock in the morning. 
Now here we are, God has started a system now, which the Hebrews are still doing. We've changed it, but they're still doing it. At 6 p.m. at night, the new day starts. Every day, he did this by day because he wants us to see that every day brings us a new opportunity, a fresh opportunity to spend time with God. Every single day there's a fresh opportunity to spend time with God. As been mentioned already, do you remember your first time with God? Your first ever time with Him? How that was, how you felt when you first started talking to Him and having communion with Him and fellowship with Him? Do you remember that? Somebody might have to wreck your brains a little harder for the next question. Can you remember the last time you spoke to him? When, how long ago was the last time you spoke to him? How long ago was the last time you actually had time with him? Spend time with him. He wants us to know that there's something here going on. There's a day he's created, there's a time sphere he's created for us to live in that gives us opportunity to spend it with him. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 it says therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you if we stay humble before God he will exalt us, lift us up, give us what we need whatever it is we need, he will lift us up to that right position at the right time now, I'm, this, this next statement is not in scripture, but I think it's implied here. The less time you take in your life to honour him, the longer it will take. I believe that's implied here, that if you don't spend no time at all honouring God, don't expect to be exalted anytime soon, because it's not going to happen. And while you're doing that, he says, get rid of your worries, get rid of your cares, get rid of the things that are concerning you, Get rid of everything that's bogging buggy you down with stuff that you're worried about. Get rid of it all. Allow him to care for you. Who do you think is better at caring for you? You or Jesus? Let him do it then. That means you have to stop trying to do it yourself. You have to stop trying to sort your own life out. Stop trying to worry about things like that. Let him do it for you. And casting your cares on, on him, the Lord showed me one time, it's a bit, the word cast means to hurl. And it's a bit like writing your problem on a fresh egg and chucking it at the foot of the cross. Can you take that back? No. It's gone. It's impossible. That's the kind of casting your cares on him, he means. You throw it down at the foot of the cross and then forget about it. And people might say, well, are you being irresponsible? Yes, completely irresponsible, because now he's responsible. Can you see that? People say, well, are you being irresponsible, not worrying about this and not... No, 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 yeah, I'm, you're correct. I am being completely irresponsible. I do not have to be responsible if he's being responsible. Can you agree with that? That's a statement some of you need to take on board there. Because God wants to bless us with that ability to be able to live our lives without worrying about anything. As soon as something crops up that you think you might be worried about, go, excuse me, just stop the world for a second. Jesus, I'm a bit concerned about this. Uh, I'm gonna give it, can you sort it out for me? Thank you very much. How many of you have been at home with your family or maybe at work? Or I mean, I've worked with people before and somebody, I've been struggling with something and I've said, oh, I'm not so sure I can do this. And somebody said, oh, I know how to do that. I had this problem with my, with my grandchildren when I was learning how to use the iPhone. I was often saying, I don't know how to, oh, they go, give it, let me do it for you. Did I still worry about how to do it? No, it's been handed over. And when people say, oh, it's okay, I can do that for you. Do you go, oh, no, no, I need to do it myself. No, you let them get on and do it. And Jesus has made a big offer here, a big offer. Cast all your cares on him, and he will care for you and look after you. Thank you, Jesus. Do you know he's better at it than you are? 
In Acts chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that Christ would suffer, as uh, he has thus fulfilled. Jesus did it all. Everything that was prophesied about Jesus, he did it. Repent therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He's saying there, if you read all the scriptures about the promises that God has made, he's fulfilled them all in Jesus. Therefore, if he's that faithful, repent and get converted, because he must be a real God if he can do that. Then your sins will be blotted out, and then the times of refreshing. What's the times of refreshing? Well, it is when God helps you and blesses you and does things for you, but it means when the Holy Spirit comes in fullness in your life. The times of real refreshing is when the Holy Spirit comes in fullness in your life, and he wants to fill you with himself. Because the Holy Spirit is not just some little ghosty thing that comes along beside you. This is God the Spirit who comes in to almost invade your life, completely fill you to overflowing. That's why we're able to pray in tongues, because that's an overflow. That's an overflow. And we can do that in Jesus' name. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? If you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit and cannot pray in tongues right now, I'm not going to do this now, See me afterwards and we'll sort it out. It will be sorted out once and for all and forever in Jesus' name. God wants you filled with the Spirit. He wants you to have times, we're still on time by the way, times of refreshing, not time of refreshing. When was the last time you had a time of refreshing? Maybe it was a while ago, have another one. Have another go. We haven't done it for a while and I think we perhaps ought to do it again soon. We used to have some... Uh, soaking nights where we came and we brought our pillows and our duvets and we laid on the floor and just relaxed before God with, with some wonderful relaxing music, Christian music and at that time some of us as led by the Holy Spirit would come around and pray over you and many people before anybody had even prayed with them had already heard from God why? because they were relaxed they couldn't hear the person next to them snoring and they were completely relaxed and they were enjoying the fact they were in God's presence doing it deliberately doing it on purpose we ought to do that again but in the meantime you can do that at home put some Christian music on, shut your eyes and let God minister to you in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 I picked this scripture up from uh, I was reading Jesse's book Heaven uh, that when he visited heaven and I read that on while we were on holiday and there was something he said in there that I picked up on 2 Corinthians 4 17 for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen but the things which are unseen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal our light affliction the hassle we get from the devil the grief and problems we get from people are all but for a moment would you like it if that scripture actually said for our light affliction which is for eternity would you like that? a lot of people are doing that they've taken the, the, the problem they've got and felt this is this, this is my life, I can't I can't ever change. It's always going to be like this. No, the problem you've got at the moment is but for a moment. How many times in the Bible does it say, and it came to pass? There isn't a scripture which says, and it came to stay. It came to pass. In other words, it's all temporary. Everything you look at, even this building, nice big building, quite solidly made, come back in 200 years time there be a pile of rubble on the ground because even the nicest, the greatest builders can't make it last forever it will start to wear away, it will start to erode a bit things will go wrong, the steel will start to rot eventually and it all falls down this we're talking about is a permanent and eternal thing the things of God so it does help us not to look at the natural 
Don't look at the natural things. Look at the eternal things. Look at the things of God. Don't look at the temporary, worldly, temporary things. Don't look at them. God wants us to focus on Him and focus on the things it says here that you can't see. Can you see faith? No. Can you see God? No. Can you see Jesus? No. Focus on them. Don't focus on the headache, don't focus on the sickness, don't focus on the lack of money, don't focus on your problem. Because as soon as you focus on your problem, you're not focusing on God, you're focusing on something temporary. Would you like something to last forever? Focus on that. Focus on God and the things He wants to do for you. Hallelujah. God is doing something in our lives and He wants us to realise that there are, there are times for different things. And at the moment in this verse he's saying our problems are only for a moment. If you have been changing them to my problem is for eternity, change it back. How do you change it back? You have to speak it. You have to say out loud to yourself and to God. You have to say I have been treating this issue and name it like it's a forever thing and can never change. I change that back to this issue is but for a moment because I'm trusting in the eternal unseen God. And that was it. Things will start to change immediately. He wants to bless us but he can't bless us while we're focusing on natural stuff. He wants us to focus on the supernatural stuff. Now here's one of the most important scriptures I think in the Bible. Ephesians 1 verse 4 Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Time as we know it began when the scripture says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's when time as we know it began. That's seen time. What about unseen time? Here is unseen time. He chose you to be one of his kids, to be part of Jesus, before in the beginning. This is unseen time. This is time thing that happened outside of our normal time. Before he started creating the worlds, he put you in the right place to be part of his family. That does take some comprehending with your brain. In fact, it takes so much comprehending with your brain, I've quit. I cannot get my head to understand it. My heart has got it completely. My spirit knows exactly what this scripture says and my head is going, I can't get that, I can't get that. So what do you say to your head? Shut up and read the Bible. If the Bible says it, it's true whether you believe it or not. He chose us to be in him before the foundation of the world so we could be holy and without blame before him in love. What does he mean by that? Holy and without blame. So that we could be. So that because we were chosen to be in him before the world was formed therefore before sin ever existed we can be so holy and so without blame before him in love because we were created to be in his kingdom before sin ever happened we, we live a life are based on the fact that we were created to be part of his family before sin ever existed. That's how holy we can be. That's how righteous we can be. He predestined us to adoption. Now some people are taking on, on board the, the idea of the theory of predestination which means he predestined some people to be part of his kingdom and some are predestinated not to be part of his kingdom. No, what this means, how he predestined us, he looked ahead and saw for every single person on the planet the day they do 
or do not accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. He watched you accept Jesus as his Lord and Saviour way back then and predestined that you would be adopted as one of his children. I think that's amazing. Which means that nothing we can do can prevent it. Once you got saved, the original plan was now put into place. The moment you got saved, his original plan is now working in your life. And you are predestined to be adopted as one of his kids. According to the good pleasure of his will. That means he likes you. He wants you to be in his family. If you think that's good, wait for the next scripture we look at. He wants you to be part of his family. He looked ahead and saw you. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've seen groups of people like queuing up for a job, people who want a job and they're queuing up for it. And I've looked at them and thought, you might as well not bother me, because they're not taking you. And look at another person and think, you know, it's, this, is a, this is a warehouse job, you, you know. I, I don't think you can do this kind of work, you're not strong enough. God has looked at every person, he's looked at you specifically and said, I want to adopt that person because it would please me to do so. I think that's wonderful. You were chosen, chosen by God deliberately to be part of his kingdom. Your time with God, I talked about earlier about spending time with God, your time with God, your time with God began before the world was formed. Before the world was formed, he'd already decided everything and you were part of him. This is this outside of time time. You are past, why you're an eternal being, that's why you're eternal. Because it was destined that you'd be part of his kingdom before he even started time. Before time even, even started, before the first tick of any clock, before the first movement of anything, it was decided you'd be part of God's kingdom. Wow, that just amazes me, absolutely amazes me. And if you think that's good, we'll look in John chapter 17 then. In verse 23, this is Jesus talking to the Father. They said, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, so the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. And read that again. You have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they may also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. He says, you love them, talking about us, you love them as you've loved me. Then he says, and you love me before the foundation of the world. That means he loved you before the foundation of the world. That is gobsmacking. <laughs> Before time began, he'd already declared he loves you. He loves you like Jesus does. So you might think, well, I've got this person and that person and that person that doesn't love me. Doesn't matter. He loves you. He loves you so much that before the foundation of the world he'd already declared I want that person to be in my kingdom but I know they're going to mess it up I just know they're going to mess it up so I'm going to send my Jesus to the cross to take away that sin and bear that sin on the cross so they can be holy and without blame before me and stand in my presence clean because of the sin that's been redeemed Hallelujah. Amen and he did that for you he loved you, he loves you, loved, I say loved because that's when it started. He loved you like he loves Jesus. And he started loving Jesus before the foundation of the world, therefore he loved you before the foundation of the world and declared that you're one of his kids. Amen. How can you ever say 
that anybody who can get saved can backslide so far they're not a Christian anymore. When if you ever made pray that prayer with from your heart, it was determined before the foundation of the world, not only would you be one of his adopted kids, he would love you. Wherever. Amen. We're loved by him. I don't know about you, I got sights me. I think that is absolutely incredible that I found this wonderful scripture here which said that God loved me before he even made this world we live on. I mean this world, you look at it and you think it's quite solid really. If you don't think so, try digging a bit deep in your garden or something, you know. The people are doing the mines and all this fracking and stuff like that. They have to work very, very hard with very complex machinery to be able to drill holes in this thing. It's quite solid. And before he even made anything solid, before anything visible, anything that could be seen was seen, the unseen was working already. The unseen time when he predestined you to be one of your children, one of his children. The unseen time when he declared he loved Jesus. And also because he loved Jesus, he loves you the same. Our Christianity, our life with God, our time with God began before the world did. Our time with God began before the world did. Your time with God began before your time on earth began. When people are born, like I'm looking at our royalty recently, the, 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 the things that have been going on, it was the Queen's birthday, the official birthday on Saturday. Her children were taught from a very young age what their inheritance was going to be. We have read from the Bible what our inheritance is going to be. And we, they, they believe what they were told. Do you believe what you were told? It tells you here. You've got a serious inheritance from God. And it makes no difference. That inheritance for each of those royal children was available to them before they were born, wasn't it? Yeah? All this blessing for you was available to you before you were even born. Because it was set in stone. No, what's most it was set in God. I would say set in stone, but you can break stone. It was set in God. Like God said once, he said, I had nothing better to swear by, so I swear by myself. Yeah? God said, I swear by Almighty me, that person is coming into my kingdom, because I watched them pray that prayer a few thousand years hence. And because they're in my kingdom, I predestined them now, they can be one of my kids. And if they're one of my kids, I'm going to love them just like I love my son. Because they are sons. And I'll say it again, ladies, you are sons of God. Because the way the Hebrew lifestyle and the Bible talks about it, only, only boys can inherit. Only sons can inherit. Well, I'm sure you ladies don't mind being called a son if it means you can inherit, do you? No, you can call me what you like, God, as long as I can have what you say. And he's blessed us with these wonderful blessings. He wants us to spend time with him to get to know these things. I spent some time, even on holiday, God was speaking to me about this, spending some time with him, not just to, to preach it, but for myself. Because hearing these words that I've just spoken, blesses me in abundance. Just absolutely gobsmacking that God loves us so much. And I've just, my eyes have just been turned to the the, the, the words on this chorus sheet here. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. You bore all my sin, all my shame. In love, you came and gave amazing grace. God wants us to spend time with him. Spend time with him and you can discover wonderful stuff like this. But when you read the word of God, read it out loud. So you can hear it because faith comes by hearing. Thank you Jesus. Amen. Give him praise.